Good afternoon and welcome to the session of the Contemporary Artist Book Conference titled Artist Book Criticism Beyond the Book. My name is Gianna Ritchie. I am the librarian for the fine arts at New York University and I'm joined today by Karina Reynolds, the executive director for the Center of Book Arts in New York. And as members of the organizing committee of the conference, we will act as your host for this session. The Contemporary Artist Book Conference has been held annually since 2008. And this year it is organized by the Center for Book Arts as part of the Printed Matter Virtual Art Book Fair. We'd like to thank the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts for their generous support of Center for Book Arts Criticism Initiative and in making the conference possible. Additional thanks to our conference sponsors, the Brooklyn Rail, Sorted Library, and Small Editions. Center for Book Arts and the usual in-person space of the Contemporary Artist Book Conference are on the unceded land of the Munsi Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging and uplifting the Munsi Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations and the lands in which you are tuning in from. There are 10 sessions overall between Friday and Sunday, exploring a wide range of questions about artist book criticism, what it is now, what it can and might be. A link to the CABC program will be posted in the chat window as well, so you can check out all the session details. These sessions include two convenings as part of the Book Art Review Initiative to help develop principles for the future of book art criticism and a closing plenary in which we will look to collect actionable ideas and recommendations that arise throughout the conference. These items will be posted on the Center for Book Arts website with progress reported during the coming year and at next year's edition of the conference. In addition to the Zoom meeting, sessions will also be live streamed on the Center for Book Arts YouTube channel and will be recorded and posted after the conference. If you have questions during the session, please post them in the chat. And as hosts, we'll be asking them on your behalf to the panelists. Attendees will be muted throughout and we'd recommend that you also keep your cameras turned off. Please feel free to chat during the session and please remain respectful of the speakers and other attendees. We'll also be posting relevant links during the talks. If you need any assistance during the session, please send a private message to anyone with CABC in their name. So now I'd like to introduce the moderator of the session. Levi Sherman founded Artist Book Reviews in 2019 to promote criticism and appreciation of contemporary artist books. Before starting ABR, Levi wrote reviews for the Journal of Artist Books and Abecedarian Gallery. He is a member of the College Book Arts Association Theory and Criticism Subcommittee and the book review editor for Openings, Studies in Book Art. Levi also makes artist books of his own and holds an MFA in book and paper art from Columbia College, Chicago. His work is held in collections including the Joan Flash Artist Book Collection and the University of Arizona Poetry Center and has been supported by grants from the College Book Arts Association, Awesome Foundation and ACO Foundation. So Levi, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Gianna. Um, and thank you all for attending this discussion. I know the virtual format is a little bit different, but pulling this off is a huge achievement. So I'd like to begin by thanking the Center for Book Arts and Printed Matter for the remarkable work they've done this year. I'm really excited to be here with my fellow panelists, Aaron Kohick, Johanna Drecker, and Megan N. Liberty. Not only are these three of the critics, scholars, and theorists that I most admire in our field, I think together the four of us are well positioned to discuss criticism beyond the book itself. The purpose of this panel is to better understand how criticism can address the context in which books are received and how these situations help or hinder criticism. This is especially important given the relative youth of our field and the reciprocal relationship among its theorists and practitioners. The fact that three of us also make books is evidence of just how close those relationships are. In other words, we have every reason to believe that criticism can actually influence what books are produced in the future and certainly how they will be received. By addressing the institutions that entangle a book from inception and production to reception and survival, we can help the field grow with an understanding of the systems that shape it. Book arts is a field continually defining and redefining itself. That definition needs to not only reflect the field's diversity, but also help ensure equity by addressing the distribution of resources as a factor that shapes the field and therefore merits critical attention. So before I go on to my presentation, I'll go ahead and introduce everybody else, and then we'll just carry through in that order. Um, so Aaron Kohick is a printer, artist, and publisher based in Colorado Springs. His work focuses on the intersection of books, print, animation, and experimental text and image making. 
He is the founder and proprietor of New Lights Press and is also the printer of the press at Colorado College. Johanna Drucker is distinguished professor and Breslauer professor in the Department of Information Studies at UCLA. She is internationally known for her work in the history of graphic design, typography, experimental poetry, fine art and digital humanities. She is also known for her artist books, which were the subject of a traveling retrospective, Druckworks, 40 Years of Books and Projects from 2012 to 2014. Megan N. Liberty writes about artist books, ephemera, archives, and other multidisciplinary meetings of text and image. She is the book, she is the art book section editor at the Brooklyn Rail and co-founder of Book Art Review. Her writing appears regularly on Hyperallergic and in Art Review and has also been published in artform.com, Art in America, Freeze, New York Review of Books Daily, and elsewhere. So those of us engaged in book art criticism can agree on a few things. It's difficult, time consuming, and doesn't pay well. So I began my project, Artist Book Reviews, the way I begin any major project, by trying to talk myself out of it. And if you're looking for an argument against artist book criticism, Ulysses Carrion is a good place to start. Of course, since I'm presenting here, you will have guessed that I ultimately won this imaginary debate. But Carrion's 1980 essay, Bookworks Revisited, remains a valuable barometer. So my presentation today will begin with his most explicit criticism of the quote, misunderstanding that books would allow artists to liberate themselves from galleries and art critics. He continues, I would like to ask what for? To fall into the hands of publishers and book critics? Let's imagine a world without artworks, a utopian society where books are the only known possibility for a creator to embody his mental and emotional world. Now imagine that the creators of this world discover the field of visual arts. We can imagine their enthusiasm as they think, no more literary critics, no more intermediaries between our works and the audience, no more prestigious publishing houses, no more translations, no more bestseller lists, no more handwritten originals, etc. For Carrion, artist books were trapped between two unsavory options, art criticism and literary criticism. Today, I would argue the situation is even worse. Rather than choosing between two systems of intermediaries, artist books are squashed beneath the combined weight of both. For example, an artist book may pass through a publisher's editor, a gallery's curator, and a journal's critic before reaching a potential reader. More likely still is that the critic's review catches the eye of a dealer who then places the book in a collection where a reader may encounter it through the added mediation of cataloging or yet another exhibition. There are important differences between criticism and these other forms of gatekeeping, but they are all forms of mediation between the work and the audience. So if we accept Carrion's position that mediation is bad, we must ask, why do criticism at all? In answering this question for artist book reviews, I formulated what I think of as a weak argument and a strong argument. Before I walk you through these arguments, I should say that my victory over Carrion was not only imaginary, but also Pyrrhic. In responding to Carrion's, to Carrion's concerns, I have raised a number of even more challenging questions that look beyond the artist reader binary at the full range of players in the field. These broader questions are ultimately the reason for this panel and are reflected in the range of participants. But for now, let me present what I think of as the weak defense of criticism. Here, we can accept a binary caricature of Carrion's choice between art critics and literary critics and simply choose the lesser of evils. For artist book reviews, this means leaning towards literary criticism in the sense that the critic operates more like a newspaper book reviewer or a book blogger than a conventional art critic. An artist or publisher sends us a copy of the work to be reviewed, and the reviews tend to focus on the form and content of the book as a self-contained expression, with the understanding that this is closer to the way another reader might encounter the book. We don't ignore context, for example, other works by an artist or other books in the same series by a publisher, but as critics, we get to define the scope of that context rather than reviewing a piece within the context established by a curator. Context is, after all, infinite, so it matters a great deal how it is defined. The weak argument is essentially, why not review books the way the readers read them? 
that fit between the reader's reading experience and the reviewer's reading experience is a matter of what Carion called specific conditions for reading. He wrote, there must be a coherence between the possible potential messages of the work, its visible appearance, and the manner of reading that these two elements impose or suggest or tolerate. With artist book reviews, I hope to convey the manner of reading that the book suggests rather than what an exhibition or some other framework imposes. The logistics and economics of book buying also impose upon the reader's experience. And in this regard, artist book reviews also tries to align more closely with its readers. For example, we receive the books by mail and keep the copies. This no doubt influences what books we receive, but in doing so ensures that a reader who decides to purchase their own copy of a book will have a similar experience. This highly practical consideration speaks to a deeper ontological issue. Carion wrote, if we consider the objectual production of works of art in book format, one copy of the book is not the book. The book is the whole edition. Receiving and owning a copy of a book allows the critic to review the book's capacity to insinuate itself into various situations. Intimacy and portability are key features of the medium. An analogy might be the difference between a theater critic who reviews a play, a single contingent instantiation of the work, versus a literary critic who reviews the playwright's script. I also hope that this analogy shows that there are real advantages to both approaches and that I'm not at all opposed to exhibition-based criticism or other formats. So this weak argument, an alignment between the reader and reviewer is necessary, at least for now, because Carion's alternative hasn't panned out. And the idea that bookstores and libraries can provide readers with unmediated access to artist books was flawed even in 1980 when Carion curiously ignored the gatekeeping role of bookstore proprietors like himself. But four decades later, the situation is less tenable still. Zine fests and art book fairs are a thrilling way to survey the field, to network, and yes, to buy tote bags full of books. Likewise, online shopping makes it easy to acquire books from faraway places. But neither of these situations allow for the intimate contemplative experience of the bookstore. In this absence, critics offer potential readers a better sense of a book's content and quality. This leads to the strong defense of criticism, which may be harder to live up to, but is easy enough to articulate. Critics can encourage artists to remain ambitious and avoid pitfalls. It was 1980 when Carion wrote, we are no longer innocent. Now it isn't enough to be an artist in order to produce book works. Now it isn't enough to produce books in order to affirm that they are book works. Surely the sentiment is doubly true today, but I think it's fair to say that some artists are still producing books to affirm that they are books. In fact, the growing popularity of the medium may be driving this perpetual rediscovery. Criticism and scholarship can help practitioners find more productive avenues in three ways. One, informing artists of what has already been done. Two, incentivizing artists by celebrating ambitious innovative works. And three, perhaps when all else fails, constructively criticizing works that fall short of advancing an important artistic argument. I hope that these two defenses demonstrate that there is a role of criti for criticism without diminishing the gravity of Carion's concerns. Especially for those of us who are also practitioners, it can be uncomfortable to get between an artist and their audience. Perhaps we should borrow from medicine the principle first do no harm. I would like to think that artist book reviews is a force for good, but its shortcomings are undeniable. Aligning the reviewer with the reader, even if there were only one monolithic reader, can scarcely address a field that also includes artists, publishers, curators, dealers, retailers, book fairs, collectors, scholars, and appreciators. Add to this the role of institutions, libraries, galleries, museums, universities, residencies, studios, and so on, and the ability for the critic to set the boundaries of context looks less like freedom and more like an impossible test. By letting the book suggest the manner in which it is read, it is easy to erase the role of institutions, capital, and labor in the production and reception of the book, but these factors impose and tolerate their own conditions. For artist book reviews, the solution has been beyond criticism, strictly speaking. Rather than expand each review into the full context of the communication circuit, I've added interviews with practitioners to the platform. 
My initial worries that interviews weren't as rigorous as reviews were quickly allayed by the realization that artists are quite willing to discuss how space, time, and money shape the books they produce. For me, the benefits of this deeper dialogue outweighed the loss of critical distance, especially since the reviews and interviews remain separate. No, these conversations aren't criticism. After all, what an artist manages to do with the means at their disposal is still open to evaluation. But such conversations are necessary for the field as a whole, a field that seems to be entering its awkward adolescent phase at a time when issues around access and equity finally have traction. Doing no harm means addressing the way that resources and opportunities are allocated among the practitioners and other players in the book arts. Artist book reviews has been a great vehicle for discovering problems with criticism, if not solving them. Fortunately, I'm joined here by three interlocutors whose varied approaches make me hopeful that this interdisciplinary field will find a way forward. And to that end, I'm pleased to hand things over to Aaron Kowick with a quick note to look out for uh, in the chat for those of you on this Zoom. Um, I'll be adding some links throughout the presentation. And I will also put in contact information and uh, links to artist book reviews for those of you interested. Um, thank you and take it away, Aaron. Thank you, uh, Levi. Um, thank you to uh, Printed Matter and um, uh, Center for Book Arts and uh, for putting all this together. Thank you to uh, Johanna and Megan for um, and Levi for inviting me to be on this panel. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here and thank you all for, uh, for being here and listening. I'm going to share my screen and jump right in here. Okay, so um, I was asked to be on this panel to talk about a very specific thing, the Book Art Theory blog published by the College Book Art Association. My plan is to quickly introduce the College Book Art Association and then talk about how and then talk about the blog, how it works, some specific posts that show its potential, and how it might point to more possibilities in creating an ecosystem of criticism and theory in and around artist publications. And of course, how you can get involved. Um, as Levi already mentioned, he'll be posting some uh, relevant links in the chat. Um, thank you for doing that, Levi. Um, so to start with the College Book Art Association or CBAA for short, and full disclosure, I am on the CBAA board of directors. So I am totally going to make a pitch for the organization here. Um, CBAA is a nonprofit membership organization focused on book arts and the teaching of book arts. As the name implies, it started as an academic association, but has expanded to include book arts teaching and learning in all of its forms and sites. The members are educators, students, artists, scholars, librarians, critics, designers, etc. really anyone interested in artist books. I think of it as a large mutual aid group and a mechanism for the redistribution of resources. Members pool money, time, energy, and expertise to give grants, awards, and scholarships, to organize exhibitions, conferences, and other events, and to create resources for use by the field. And one last and very important note to end my pitch for CBAA, membership is free for students and for everyone else, it is on a pay what you want scale starting at zero dollars. So if it sounds at all interesting, I definitely encourage you to join and to pay what seems reasonable to you. So the book art theory blog is one of the many things that CBAA does. The blog itself has a main editor, Susan Vigors, and then a group of moderators that solicit and write posts. The moderators are made up of volunteers from the membership. I've been a moderator and writer for several years. The blog has published a post on the 1st and 15th of every month since October of 2015. It missed once on September 1st, 2019. And I just wanna take a moment to publicly acknowledge and thank Susan Vigors for all of her work in making that happen for the past five plus years. Thank you, Susan. It's incredible to look back now and see the accumulation of all those years of work and it keeps going. So the blog itself is just that, nothing fancy, just a blog using a setup from circa 2002, it's mostly text, some images, some hyperlinks. It has an editorial statement that is purposefully wide. 
quote, capitalizing on the interdisciplinary nature of the field, this blog calls attention to criticism and theory about the book as a medium and or subject in works of art and more generally about book art. It seeks to encourage dialogue, solicit comments and create a generative space for new ideas from critics and theorists of various fields regarding the aesthetic, semiotic, haptic, cognitive, historical, and other features that distinguish these works and their function in ethical, political, and social matters." End quote. And for me, the most interesting part of that statement is the end. It explicitly mentions the function of art and then how that connects to, quote, the ethical, political, and social matters which is an acknowledgement that art is inseparable from all of those considerations, which Levi was talking about as well. Um, working on books and publications tends to foreground those aspects, and I appreciate that the editorial statement makes space for them. And I'll admit that it seems strange to be talking about a blog in 2021, um, but what, what excites me about this blog and the blog format in general is that openness, the generative space that is mentioned in the editorial statement. The book Art Theory blog is purposefully informal and open to experimentation. Some posts are journalistic, while others are more like thoughtful personal journal entries. There is some theory, of course, and some reviews with plenty of experimentation with text and image. Some of my favorite posts have been Responding to the New Art of Making Books by India Johnson and Andrea Bell Aruti, a post that talks about uh, Ulysses Carrion's classic manifesto, The New Art of Making Books, in terms of sculpture and process, and then links to a Google Doc of a new translation of the Carrion text and a whole new rewritten, a uh, whole new piece, The Old Art of Making Books. Um, then there's We're All Water by Marianne Dages and Where All Water Continues by Leah Mackin, which are linked posts on writing process, technology, and the work of Madeline Ginz and Kamal Braithwaite. There's The Case for Memes by Beth Sheehan about book arts memes and how they might be used in critique. Making Books by Hand, Struggle and Grace by Emily Larned, which is a post about process, repetition, and making an addition. Two recent posts by Alexander Mouton, Extending Literature Through the Artist Book and Nonlinearity and the Hyperlink on artist slash photo books as a kind of literature. H.R. Beechler's intricate series of posts called On the Threshold, Entertaining Specificity that tangle and untangle the frames, forms, and formats of books and publications. And Compulsory End of Year Navel Gazing by Andrea Kohashi, on sorting out a postgraduate identity and artistic practice. And of course, that list is by no means exhaustive. There are so many really great posts. Um, <clears throat> and I think that this blog and the many others that we should all start, plus newsletters, websites, et cetera, can become a kind of foundational seed layer for new writing and thinking about the field. These can be very general, unfocused things like the CBAA blog, and there can be projects that are more specific like a blog or newsletter about photo books or about activist publications. The general point being to have a healthy, diverse, wild and informal space that is also public, a space where ideas can be cultivated, tested and shared, a space that can be built from the bottom up. Going back to that first post I showed by India Johnson and Andrea Bellaruti with that link to the Google Doc, well, that is a really simple, elegant way to make the text accessible and it's a first round of publishing that could eventually become a book or another project or publication. I find the ordinariness and effectiveness of the Google Doc and this table containing the text to be really compelling somehow. There is an aesthetic and maybe even a materiality there inseparable from the accessibility. It's a kind of digital immediacy. And back to the blog forum, it's not platform specific. So all of that work is not captured monetized and algorithm to death by social media companies. I love the way that Levi publishes with artist books reviews. It uses social media, but isn't limited by it. As makers and critics of books and book like things, we can and should be very aware and careful about form and platform, about who benefits and who is excluded. I really believe that this community is particularly well equipped 
to build an inclusive, dynamic, and sustainable ecosystem for artists' books and artists' books criticism. It's clearly already started, right? That's what we're all doing here. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what the future holds and what we can all build together. And hey, if you don't wanna start your own blog or newsletter yet, but you have some ideas that you need to write about, the College Book Art Association Book Art Theory blog accepts submissions. You do not have to be a member, but you could be. So um, if you have something you wanna write about, just email the editor, Susan Figures, at blog at collegebookart.org and let her know what you're thinking about. Thank you. I think I'm next, right, Levi? Yeah, go ahead. Awesome, thank you. All right, well, thank you, Levi, for inviting me to be on this panel and to my fellow panelists. It's really great to be here. Um, when I got into artist books so many years ago, I had no idea there was a community like this waiting and to see over 100 people here tuning in is pretty amazing. I'm sure we all wish we could be in person, but there's something really special about being able to reach a global audience like this. That's very exciting. Uh, as Levi noted in my intro, I have a few roles within the uh, art book world. But today I will primarily be speaking about my role as the art book section editor at the Brooklyn Rail. The field of art books and artist book criticism, a field I would argue, and many of us here have, have set up, our, uh, it's emerging but rapidly growing. It's shaped and influenced by a number of institutions, many of which have already been noted by my fellow speakers today, and as many other fields of criticism are also shaped by many institutions. But the book is perhaps more vulnerable or even susceptible to the influence of these institutions because of its hybrid nature and how easily it can fall prey to the conventions of existing models of criticism, primarily visual arts and the traditions of art historical criticism and literature and the traditions of literary or poetry criticism. Both fields offer much to the critical approaches we use to book art, but book, work, but book works are also like sculptures and they're temporal like film and performance, adding further genres of criticism and study to the mix here. I like to pause to make a quick note on terminology here. I have so far used four different terms purposefully, art book, artist book, book art, and book work to indicate the way that terminology is perhaps the first framing institution that we have to deal with. These terms are set by librarians, archivists, curators, art historians, and writers, and each represent their own institutional backgrounds and approaches to the field. Each of us here in attendance uh, at this talk have specific ideas in mind when I say each of these terms, and likely we don't all agree. In my opinion, this is exciting and shows the potential, diversity, and mobility of this genre that is still evolving today. But for critical purposes, it does muddy the starting point of writing about a work when we first must all agree on whether it even fits into this genre. This is a topic for another panel. And in fact, uh, there is going to be a panel later this afternoon on terminology that I encourage you all to attend. But for now, I just wanted to mention this before talking about the institutions I myself am involved with. Going forward, I prefer the term book work because of its emphasis on work, but because of today's theme, taking the temperature of artist book criticism, I'm gonna continue to use that term. So what institutions frame my approach to artist book criticism? As an editor at the rail, I represent the institution of the magazine or the newspaper which has a different approach to criticism than say academic scholars. My interest is in a kind of criticism that uses plain language and is largely readable to the average reader of cultural criticism more broadly. Also, my background is in both literary and visual arts. I have a master's in art history, so I'm trained in writing about art through the discipline of art history but also my bachelor's is in English Lit. So really I came to writing about art after first writing about texts 
And I say text to reference Ulysses Carrion and his notion of books versus the text inside them to distinguish between the kind of writing we're talking about here today, which does consider the whole object of the book versus the kind of writing I was taught in undergrad that focused just on the contents within. So as the editor of a section titled art books, not book works, artist books or book art, it does cover more than just the types of books we're here to talk about today. I've been the editor of the section since 2018 and began writing for the Brooklyn Rail, specifically the art book section uh, in 2015. I was super excited to see that a section like this even existed and immediately just dove right into writing for it. When I took over as editor, there weren't clearly written out or stated guidelines for what we as an institution considered an art book. So my first task was to sort of develop these institutional guidelines that I could share with writers. And as much as I resist putting a box around these terms, as an editor, it is necessary for building and growing a body of criticism that is not yet fully defined. So I'm going to try to drop this link in the chat for all of you to the uh, Google Doc I share with uh, writers who are interested in contributing to the art book section to give them a sense of uh, what I'm looking for in the section and what I'm looking less for. Uh, some of the broad categories of books uh, we review in the section include collections of criticism, artists writing in sketchbooks and other sorts of published ephemera or archival materials. Artist books, including self-published books, books by small presses, and more widely distributed, larger, larger trade edition style artist produced or designed books. My other two guidelines, uh, which I will come back to, are that the book must be recent, as in published within the last six months of when we will publish the review. And it must be accessible to rail readers. Usually this means that it's available in a bookstore or on view in an exhibition, but it can also mean that it is easily requested at a public library. Uh, a quick note, I was really interested in Levi's talk uh, of his idea of these places as gatekeepers. And that's something that I hope we come back to in the Q&A, thinking about the role that how people access these books comes into play. So I'll come back to those specific two guidelines later because I know they do create the most limitations on my section and what we can cover. As for what we usually don't cover, uh, I developed this list by asking myself uh, some questions, primarily, why does this have to be a book? And what does this content or substance offer to us in book form that it would not in another form? And does it need promotion in a section devoted to materials that already get less coverage? Since as part of what we're talking about today, we know that art books and artist books in particular are not widely reviewed as other arts. So that means we don't usually review in the art book section of the Brooklyn Rail, we don't usually review exhibition catalogs um, unless the catalog does something interesting or specific that the experience of going to the exhibition itself doesn't offer. I find that usually, not always of course, when people review exhibition catalogs, they really just want to review the exhibition. We also don't cover big survey coffee table books as much that are very broad and, gen and, and more general focused, like a big book on women designers or even a big coffee table book on artist books because it wouldn't offer the depth required to really get into the meat and bones of the content and to offer that kind of critical experience. Finally, we also don't really review uh, monographs and biographies of established artists with this. I really come back to why a book? Why does it need to be promoted in this space that's devoted to art books? And books published, um, art, are my, art, my section only publishes four print reviews and one web, re web review each issue. So it's really thinking about how that space can be best used to serve, um, I hate to use the word promote, but also to promote and give critical space to something that would not get the space elsewhere and popular monographs and biographies of already established artists are likely to get this, this coverage elsewhere. And while biographies are important, um, you know, 
I do make an effort to cover artists who have been less frequently talked about. So we do cover biographies of artists who are underrepresented, haven't had as much critical attention paid to their work. And I do feel like that's important as well as biographies that make use of unpublished materials and allow the reader to have that experience reading the archival materials as well. As I said, many of these titles don't necessarily fit within the specific realm of artist books, but this gives you a sense of the larger context of the editorial section that, I, that I'm dealing with. Now to get back to the guidelines I mentioned earlier about timing and access, uh, regarding the six month window guideline, what I'm hoping to do with that is create a sort of event or a buzz around the books and their release, much like we feel around an exhibition opening and much the way that exhibitions are only reviewed primarily when they're open or shortly after they close. Uh, I try to use that same logic for art books. As for the guidelines about accessing the book and thinking about the role of gatekeeping institutions that Levi mentioned, I think what makes books as art exciting is the immediacy that anyone can have an immediate and intimate experience with a work of art. It feels important to me that if we are devoting space to something that people can see it, that people can access it. But I do know that these two guidelines are also limiting. Some publishers are not able to send out advanced review copies or have their materials publicized in a timeline that allows for the review to come out within six months. Likewise, books produced in small editions often can't be sent as review copies at all. I'm certainly aware of these problems. And one of the questions uh, I pose to all of you, and then I hope that something that comes out of this conference and this session are ways of uh, solving these problems and thinking about ways to better get these books into the hands of critical readers and critical writers, and in doing so, expand and grow the field of artist book criticism. Thanks. Okay, um, I have to say I want to stand up and cheer. That was wonderful, Megan. And, um, you know, many, many thoughts here that I would love to, uh, you know, sort of celebrate. Um, and uh, also in Aaron and, and Levi's talks, but, um, but Megan, I have to say, I appreciate the, the succinctness and clarity um, with which you state many things that I have great sympathy for. And I think the whole idea of why is it a book and why does it need to be in this medium is probably the, the crux of the critical issue. And I would amend that slightly by saying, or extend it, not so much amend it, um, by one of the pieces of my mantra, which is how. How is it a book? And how does the medium function? So I'll come back to that at the end, but um, you know, uh, just terrific. And terrific to see all of this energy, actually, um, on all of your parts. Um, I said I would uh, finish, come at the end to, to give sort of a long view here of criticism in the field of artist books. And as most of you know, um, it's a long view. Um, I made my first book almost 50 years ago. So, you know, we don't even want to go there, right? But the point is that um, what, what's interesting is that in the mid 1970s, I was working in the context of a, a literary uh, print shop in the Bay Area. Um, it was around 1976 and Joan Hugo and Judith Hofberg, names that should be known to some of the people here, but not perhaps all, um, came to the West Coast Print Center and they were from Southern California, um, art librarians and uh, people involved in artist book activity. And they came to the West Coast Print Center and they were looking for artist books. They said, well, here's this print center that's funded by the NEA and, and, and what is it doing? And, and they came in and they were looking around and said, where are the artist books? Where are the artist books? And I remember meeting them. And, and, and at the time I had several books I had printed that you know, published, print, printed and published myself that I began to show them. And they were like, oh, but before that, it was like, it was literary small press publishing. There really weren't artist books. We weren't doing artist books. It wasn't the mission of the um, institution, but it also it is striking to me that in 1976, when they were asking that question, almost nobody in that institution could answer 
them because they didn't know what was being looked for. It's like, what, 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 what are you talking about? You mean something with pictures in it? You mean a photographic book? Now, we were publishing things that were part of the conceptual photo book world, but not so very, very much. But anyway, I mentioned this because again, um, you know, I'm less and less interested over time in the question of classification. I don't care about, is it an artist book or not an artist book? What I'm interested in is how is it a work that uses the book in some way? And that can be very minimal or it can be very maximal, but how is it a work that uses the book and could not be anything but a book and therefore is contributing something to the discourse of contemporary culture? a critical issue, an ethical issue, a personal issue. And one of the great things about artist books is in some ways they've been a very unregulated space, right? The, it's like, you can make a book, right? It's, you know, you, you make a painting. But, um, but the question of how we use criticism in relationship to this widespread practice, um, I think comes down to two core issues for me. The first one um, is there's so much stuff. There's just so much stuff. So one of the roles of a critic is to say, look at this, because this is interesting and worth your time. And, you know, so we rely on critics to survey a much broader field than they report on. And I think of this in relationship to curators as well. When I think about my fantastic colleagues, uh, Robert Gore in the Art Library, Russell Johnson down in um, Health Sciences, Jeannie Garrard, I mean, the people I work with, they look at so much material and then they say, okay, this, this is worth keeping, this is worth preserving, this is worth showing to students, this is worth showing to researchers. So the first role of the critic is to help us, you know, sort of focus on things that are of interest. And again, not at, to the exclusion of other materials, but just because there's so much stuff, right? So, um, and you don't have to agree with them. I often disagree with the choices that, you know, my friends and colleagues make, but that's not the point. The point is that the first job of the critic is to say, this is worth your time. And I think the second job of the critic, and, and all of you have already touched on this, is to give viewer readers an insight into how to have the experience that the work provides. Now, some works are more self-evident than others, but other works we know benefit from that critical opening up for having someone standing next to you. I mean, how many exhibits have I been in where, you know, Susan B is saying to me, oh no, you know, look at that. This is good. This is good. I'll tell you, this is good. And it's like, and I'm thinking, really? And then, you know, little by little I get shown why it's interesting. Okay, so those are the two functions I want from criticism. Call something to attention and show me why. Show me why and how it's of interest. So um, if I go back then to my own engagement with criticism in this field, again, I'm a practitioner. I make books, I've made books again for, for many, many decades. Um, the first understanding I had of critical in intervention in the field was when Joan Lyons was putting together, together the critical anthology and source book. And at the time, my colleagues and mentors, <clears throat> um, uh, Betsy Davids and James Petrillo, were writing an article for that particular anthology. There are still, in that 1985 anthology, articles that cannot be surpassed. They're, they are as useful now as they were at that time. And, um, but they were written from within fairly circumscribed understandings of the field. There wasn't at that point what I would call a metacriticism. It wasn't a sense that there was a kind of set of principles against which we could reference the kind of investigations that form the articles in that work. So they were kind of reports in depth but from what almost without a frame. It's called the Critical Anthology and Source Book, and the editor was Joan Lyons. Um, okay, so, so fast forward, and we get to the mid 90s, and the time I was um, married to Brad Freeman and working with Steve Clay. And uh, we were, you know, we knew Clive Philpott. We were having all kinds of discussions about artist books. I mean, we knew everybody around who was doing artist books, of course. Um, and uh, and the question was, why isn't there why isn't there a better critical, more robust critical, um, you know, discussion in this field? 
you know, well, why, why hasn't that happened since Joan Lyons's publication? There really hadn't been very much in terms of critical writing. There were, there were wonderful catalogs, short essay pieces and stuff, Germano Salant's work. Um, I mean, I could cite a whole bunch of things. And so I decided that, okay, um, uh, there's a backstory I can tell if somebody wants, but we decided to do um, a book called The Century of Artist Books. And I say we, because though I wrote the book, I couldn't have written that book if Tony Zwicker, Steve Clay, and especially Brad Freeman hadn't been involved in helping me understand how to look at books and how to think about them. I take responsibility for all the crimes in that book, you know, and so forth. But that was a systematic attempt to lay out a critical framework for looking at the field. And it does that. And it did it in 1994. And it also happened at the same time that Brad decided to found the Journal of Artist Books, which for 25 years, as you know well, Levi, for 25 years was the sole publication to really focus on artist books, right? There was Ampersand and there were a few other things. After the Century of Artist Books was published, I tried to get several mainstream journals interested in letting me write about artist books on a regular basis. And it just, nobody wanted it because again, they seem like, well, they're not that important. They're not regular. You know, it's like, what, where do they fit? And what's been interesting to me is to watch how video came to have a place in the art world when artist books did not, and they kind of started from the same place. So, um, so in 2004 then, um, the next project I was involved with, because Journal of Artist Books, you know, continued and I would always write for it when Brad had empty space and he'd say, I need a couple columns, you know, to fill out the journal, I'd say, okay. And, um, and uh, you know, I went on to do other things, including work on Ilya Stanievich, um, the biography of whom I have just published. And it's again, a study of a particular formation of book art um, and engagement with the book as a modern form. But in 2004, um, in the context of digital humanities at the University of Virginia, I created a project and platform called Artist Books Online. And the critical aspect of that project, again, conceived 10 years after the Century of Artist Books, was to try to use metadata in a way that would call attention to the features of books that go back to this question, why a book? and how a book. So if you know anything about the history of metadata, cataloging, descriptive cataloging really comes out of the, you know, there's a whole world of, of just, you know, straight up bibliographical description, but then, you know, for, uh, for rare books, for, you know, um, sort of works that have a, a detailed provenance or some kind of specialized character or quality, there's augmentation that goes on. But the specialized vocabulary that we did, developed for Artist Books Online, and here Dora Boehm was in, in, involved with this project, as well as Joan Lyons, as well as Clifton Metter, Phil Zimmerman, a whole bunch of, a bunch of people who were, you know, sitting in different roles within this community, artists, book artists, curators, librarians, and so forth. The idea was, could we come up with a set of terms that weren't part of the Library of Congress or the, you know, Getty um, vocabularies, but that said, re show us how the book works. And this goes back to this concept of work. Show us how the book works. How is it a work? What is the work that it does? And so things like sequence and development and, and so forth um, were properties of the book that we thought should be called to attention. The upshot of this was, uh, of course, we did the, the, I did do that platform, it still exists sort of mothballed, um, but uh, was a lot of pushback. Um, and in particular, I won't say from whom, I can dish that for if you want, but um, pushback from various members of the pedagogical, as it were, community, who said, this is too hard. I can't think this hard. This is too, I, why don't you just show the books? So, you know, I have no patience with that kind of garbage. As far as I'm concerned, that's just intellectual laziness. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, um, so, so we went on to do, I went on to do that project. Um, and again, it's there and, and it's used. Um, and in kind of pulling this to a close then, um, if I were to say, what are the things that seem really compelling to me about 
the intellectual challenge of writing about artist books, it's that on the one hand, we do have this kind of free range space. Like I go into the printed matter book fair when it's a, even in a virtual space, you know, there's so much stuff being produced and stuff at every, from every direction, from all kinds of communities and at all levels of production values. And I think this is great. This, this is right. This is, this is a good idea. However, the process through which some of that material comes to be valued and called to attention and then also collected, maintained for future um, work, that's more complicated. And um, again, unfortunately, I still see a lot of work collected that's collected simply on the basis of production values and not on the basis of conception values or social values, right? So to me again, when I look at a work, I wanna think about what is the work it does? And that concept of work kind of goes to what Aaron was talking about, I think in some of his final slides, that that work you know, is aesthetic work. What is aesthetic work? Why is it different from other kinds of work? It's different because Aesthetics is the domain in which we call things to attention through material, formal, and performative expression. And understanding those performative dimensions of a work of art so that it has some purchase, it has some impact, it has some engagement um, with the world around us um, is the thing that I feel most interested in developing a critical language for because that seems to me to go right back to where I started and I'll come to an end then, which is not just to ask, you know, why is it a book, but how in being a book does it do the work that it does? And that work is not just formal work, though formal work is important, I believe in, you know, sort of understanding um, the, the, the formal features of, of an aesthetic work, but the work is social, it's, 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 cultural, it's, you know, engaged with um, providing some kind of insight into what it is to have the experience of being a human being, right? We make art to have space to call attention to what it is to have experience. And in a world of overflowing, you know, monoculture, polyculture and so forth, carving out that space, giving the pause, looking at something is so powerful. And uh, I'll finish just by saying that, for instance, last night I, I did one of my book clinics at the Center for Book Arts. And there was just, there were all kinds of wonderful projects that people brought. Um, but one of them, and I hope I'm not embarrassing this person by calling her out, but this wonderful book by a woman named Amanda Sauer, who had a series of photographs documenting over time the attack of an ash tree by a particular invasive beetle species and the quietness of it and the profundity and the tragedy of it were absolutely beautifully presented in this book format so that you had the temporal unfolding of what is not just a single tragedy but an index to a much greater set of concerns with which we all are engaged. So let's think about a work like that. And it was like, wow, you know, there it is. That one work, that book work made that space to call something to attention through its means and its working and its performative dimensions. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, while we're waiting for any questions to come in from the chat, um, I wonder if we could just, I, I, I kind of wanted to follow up on this idea. Um, you know, you mentioned the question of how do we develop a critical language? And it, you know, it strikes me that Megan talked about coming from, you know, an English background originally where you learn to write about the text rather than the book. Um, I have, you know, a BFA and an MFA. So I would say like, you know, I learned studio critique rather than criticism. And I think what Aaron talked about, this idea of the, the blog as a generative kind of open space for people to try different approaches, maybe that's, you know, one answer certainly, or the answer to how to develop a critical language. 
Um, but I, I'm wondering if the three of you could, you know, reflect on how how do we develop more critics, or how do we, at the very least, introduce that critical language to more people, even if they don't want to practice criticism as a way of learning how to look and appreciate. Well, I'll just say one thing, Levi, and that is that I would say within the context of the programs where people are teaching artist books, that it would be very helpful to have, you know, a course on how to write about artist books. I mean, certainly you when if you're in an MFA program of any kind, um, you're usually involved in workshop activity where you're learning how to talk about your colleagues work. Um, you do you have to write artist statements that are, you know, that that really articulate a point of view. Um, and I think certainly if you're in art history or literary, you know, literary work, you have to, you know, constantly be honing those critical skills. But artist books haven't had that kind of disciplinary um, center for critical work. Um, and so I think that's a, a possibility. I, I mean, I, you know, I just, I hate formulas and I hate rules and I hate orthodoxy. And so the question is, you know, also how do we keep from prescribing, you know, and proscribing what things should be? Cause I, you know, what criticism should be. Yeah, I think just piggybacking off of that, it's so interesting that you, Johanna, just said how much you hate prescribing rules. And I also feel that as well, I mentioned in my presentation, having to say what is and isn't an artist book is such a, or an art book or any of these categories is such a conversation I'm not interested in having. But at the same time, we have to give writers the language to help them define these objects as something that is more than a literary book and different than a purely visual object. And so that's kind of where I wonder, at least for me coming from, as you, as I said, uh, a mixed background in both visual and verbal arts, it's almost like I had to unlearn certain trainings from both disciplines in order to be able to write about artist books. On the one hand, this idea of a purely visual object is very useful in thinking about the artist book as something we see and experience and what its visual properties are. On the other hand, the tools I learned in my literary practice as, as an English lit student, thinking about being able to draw out specific points of text and spend a very long time on small analysis of small aspects was very useful. But then in both disciplines, they sort of negate each other when we have to consider all these things in an object that's both uh, durational and tactile and sculptural, uh, as well as something seen in red. Yeah, but you know, Megan, you just said it. And yeah. it's like, it, you know, that set of principles is, is not impossible for people to engage with. And again, this is where, again, what's part of the function of criticism is that it enhances your appreciation of, of and it enhances your experience. So, you know, um, I think, you know, that set of, of of features that you just called out, um, again, it, it's like that, in, in keeping those terms um, really engaged in the conversation, I think it's useful. Um, and, um, but, you know, again, I can remember some years ago when we first started doing pretty aggressive criticism, it was the jab period of jab um, in the Journal of Artist Books. And, you know, we got all kinds of, you know, slammed for it this way and that way. And I think I wrote a piece, I think, I can't remember, I can't remember most of the things I write, but um, I wrote a piece, I think that was called something like Beyond Velveeta. And it's like, you know, it, I mean, you may not have grown up with Velveeta. I hope for your sake, you did not. Um, but, you know, we grew up on Velveeta, which was a cheese product. And at a certain point in your, you know, no animals were harmed, believe me. And, um, you know, at a certain point, you begin to be exposed to things that expand your, your appreciation of what cheese might be, right? And yeah, sure, it, sells, it smells like gym socks, but boy, it tastes so great. And, you know, so you begin to, to have a greater appreciation. So, you know, it's like, again, the, the, the point of criticism is, it, uh, 
I think it increases your appreciation and experience of things. But not everyone agrees, so fine. I'm not gonna drag people kicking and screaming into the criticism chamber in order to make them you know, do criticism workouts. I mean, what, if you wanna be lazy, be lazy, I don't care. But don't make decisions about what gets saved for posterity and how scarce resources like attention and money get spent. <laughs> Levi, we have some uh, questions in the chat related to librarians, and I'm going to selfishly uh, postulate that question since I am a librarian. Um, we have a couple of different people that um, are curious about this concept of the gatekeepers. And, um, you know, there are a lot of positive things that come out of having artist books in library collections, but Perhaps some of you could talk about the drawbacks, um, if they exist for you, um, having artist books in circulating libraries, special collections, or maybe some of the things that you wish librarians knew or, or were doing that are not currently doing that can promote um, artist book criticism and the awareness of artist books in general. Megan, I know you mentioned um, libraries. It sounded like maybe as something to circle back to. Uh, did you want to start with this one? Yeah, sure. Um, well, one idea I've kind of been talking about with a few people, with Karina, who's on here somewhere in one of these boxes as well, uh, is just the idea of how to use libraries as collecting institutions that also make, that are available to the public to walk into and view objects to make that more well known to writers and to kind of bridge that gap between what a library is collecting and access to the public. So perhaps a monthly newsletter that goes out to interested critics with new additions to the collection this month of artist books and kind of instructions on how to make an appointment to view them and the fact that it, they are available to see. Um, I, I think it's interesting to think about these kinds of institutions, as you said, Levi's gatekeepers. Um, I. I think that's true, though I'm sort of resistant to that idea because I love libraries and I, I really think that they are an amazing resource for budding critics who all can't afford to buy books or for publishers that can't afford to send review copies out. I feel like there's a missing link there that we can kind of use and I haven't quite figured it out yet, but that's something I've been thinking about. Yeah, different collections have had different policies. As you know, the Arthur Jaffe collection, for instance, down in uh, South Florida, Florida Atlantic, um, uh, Jaffe made it a uh, part of the bequest that the shelves be open and that people be able to go in, browse, look at things. And I know a lot of zine collections very actively involved in that kind of access program. Um, and, you know, um, I know that our curators, are, our librarian curators are always really keen to show off um, the books and do classes, get students involved and so forth. Um, you know, again, it's a resource issue to some extent, which is, you know, time and also the, you know, wanting the materials to be used and, and yet also wanting to make sure that they do last um, for, you know, some generations. Um, so the, um, you know, I think the, uh, oh, I'll stop there. Um, but it, it's, it is really, you know, again, students love the work and, um, and writers love the work. I think, you know, one of the things that Charles Alexander tried to do when he went to the Minnesota Center for Book Arts was really kind of pull the writing community and the book arts community together in a more synthetic way. I think the photography and print world and, and artists have, have found, their way into artist books more quickly than than writers and you know one of the you know classic cliche things is that you know writers say they're writing a book but they're not writing a book they're writing a text they're not thinking about the book format necessarily now there are plenty of good exceptions to that but again um, I have found it really interesting to work, you know, and give workshops at places like Beyond Baroque, where it's really something aimed at thinking about the book as a writer's medium, as well as as an artist's medium, um, and to see what that does for the way people think about um, the book format as, as integral to their conception. That's great. I, I really liked what you said, Johanna, about um, 
the critic helps us to focus on what is of interest because there's just so much stuff. And to me, that is what a librarian does, right? When someone comes with a research question, we work to focus your research on, on what you can access. So thank you for that. Um, we have another question in the chat for Megan. And the question is, um, why do you think that people that want to review exhibition catalogs want to review their related exhibition? <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, I want to say I'm not saying this as a as a rule always. Um, I'm actually doing a talk with C with Center for Book Arts next month that's actually about exhibition catalogs as sort of in the hands of artists, kind of exhibition catalogs as artist books. So I definitely think there are examples of catalogs that are thinking about the book form. But a lot of cat, I mean, one of the questions for that talk is what's the function of an exhibition catalog? And for the most part, it's to document the exhibition. So if you can go see the exhibition, um, then that's kind of the content that you're wanting to write about. Uh, again, if the catalog does something different, I'm always happy to have it. But for the most part, when I do get pitch catalogs, they're for very popular exhibitions. And the writer really just wants to talk about the content of the exhibition and isn't really thinking about what the book is offering outside of that. Thank you. Um, one more question. It says it's from Backbone Books. How can I start building awareness in this field in Latin America where art is not a priority? You know, uh, one of my library colleagues, TK Sangwin, has been doing a whole series of uh, talks spotlighting uh, books in Mexico and, and Latin America. Um, so I would suggest um, connecting with those communities of already existing artists. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to fail miserably if I try to remember many of the, the any of the names and specifics. Um, but there's uh, certainly, uh, you know, um, uh, enough uh, uh, ongoing active activity in the artist book world to um, certainly in Mexico is quite developed and, and um, multifaceted. But TK Sangwin is my colleague um, and uh, you can find her on the UCLA library website. And I would take a look at the series that she's put together and think about um, where the start points are for building on that existing community. I would also just add the note that, you know, it doesn't take that many people or that many interventions to kind of start building bridges and getting things to snowball. Um, you know, one example I can think of is um, after there was a guest edited version or edition of Jab um, from Isabel Barona in Portugal, yeah. we every year we continued to get an outsized number of submissions from Portugal and you know, her own critical publication, um, like an annual collection, like really has built a lot of momentum. And then once those inroads are made, I, I think that there's a lot of interest and people are willing to, you know, kind of keep building upon that initial intervention. Okay, next question. Um, are any of you aware of any work that's been done on comparing traditions of book criticism in other languages or other national traditions? Uh, I'm wondering if there is anything to be gained from a comparativist approach. Well, there's one very major kind of um, generative tension in the French tradition versus the um, Anglo tradition. And um, by the French tradition here, I'm really sort of referencing Anne Moglin Delcroix, whose name should be mentioned here because of her contributions. And, um, you know, for Delcroix, the, the, um, the artist book, um, it, it's very defined um, in classificatory terms, and it begins with Rouchet and is the conceptual work. Um, and so there is an interesting comparison to be made there between that tradition you know, um, the French, of course, have a long tradition of the livre d'artiste as well, um, and also the fine, the, the fine literary uh, press work, which is not the same thing, but they're, you know, sort of in, um, you know, the book club kind of tradition of beautifully made, beautifully illustrated um, editions, but they're not, they're not the deluxe livre d'artiste. 
Um, and I think if you look at the, you know, the history of the kind of Russian avant-garde and its engagement with book arts, again, you know, the writings of El Zitsky and, um, and others, um, and, well, and Elias Denievich, um, you know, they, they bring a different kind of sensibility um, into the understanding of, of, of book art and criticism. So those would be a few start points, but I, that's about the limit of my understanding. Um, again, when I think about in the, in the Journal of Artists books, there are a number of really, especially in the later last, sort of the final decade of the Journal of Artists books, there's a number of really wonderful um, reports from Germany, from Portugal, from, um, from France, from Australia that bring these different perspectives into view. So I would, I would really encourage people to go back and look at the Journal of Artists books. I can take no credit at all for any of that work or the editorial or production work. It's all Brad Freeman um, and print fellows um, like Levi, but um, you know, there's there's a lot of good material in there that's quite um, you know sophisticated and shows how far the field had come in the twenty some years that Jab was publishing. Um, along those lines, I would say um, there was an article in Jab by Leszek Burgowski, which was partly about um, you know, fixed book prices and sort of. Um, amount of variation of books available. And, you know, I do think, and it's something I wrote about actually for the CBAA uh, blog as well, is, you know, that the United States doesn't have a price floor under books, which is partly why we don't have a large variety of what's available in independent bookstores. Um, you know, so in tying back to the theme of the panel, think about these institutions that kind of entangle the book. Um, that may be one avenue, you know, for a comparative approach to criticism, which, you know, I don't know anything about. I would just say that maybe, you know, comparing the role of these different institutions, you know, the position of bookstores and libraries and the economics of book production um, would probably be a pretty interesting avenue to approach that. Does anyone know about a um, press or publisher or artist that's doing translations of artist books? I, I, I don't know any, that's why I'm curious. Ugly Duckling does some, but. Yeah, Ugly Duckling does some, and they've been really um, good about, uh, you know, some of those projects. I don't know, some of my, my, my diagrammatic writing has been translated into multiple languages, including Korean, which was just amazing to me. Um, so I know individual works that have been translated, but um, I don't know that there's any press that's systematically been um, engaged with that activity. Have you seen anything like that, Megan, press that's doing it? Um, yeah, Ugly Duckling is, you know, again, one of the, you know, sort of really serious editorial undertakings in the field of books as cultural production. Um, um, there is a new book um, called Copy, Tweak, Paste, and it's sort of about like appropriation and, um, you know, in artist books. And one of the things they, they sort of introduce is this new vocabulary of, I mean, not new, but from other, you know, kind of importing from other disciplines of thinking about facsimiles versus bootlegs versus translations. Um, and in that book, and it's um, Rob Van Lysen, um, you know, he mentions some series from publishers, you know, that have done facsimiles, some of which are translated. Um, so not strictly translation, but I think that, that that's like a whole nother avenue that also seems pretty promising of, you know, a new vocabulary to kind of bring in to artist books. Um, because there's like such a wide range of, you know, facsimiles looking at like the some of the futurist books and more like art historical things that have been you know, published recently, some of which are translated, some aren't, some have new critical material, some don't. Could you say the name of that book again? It was Copy, Tweak, Paste? Um, yeah, Copy, Tweak, Paste, and then there's a subtitle, um, something about appropriation in artist books, maybe methods of appropriation. Oh, and it's been put into the chat for everyone. Awesome, love it. Great, this is great. Um, Okay, so next question says, um, I am a young scholar with graduate degrees in literature and art history and hope to specialize in artist books in my academic career. I found it difficult to locate potential PhD advisors in art history <laughs> or literature departments. For people in my situation who do want to seriously engage with artist books in academia, 
Do you have any advice regarding how to proceed given the context we've discussed in which artist books are not currently invited into mainstream disciplinary scholarship? Um, I would love to just speak to this. Uh, I don't know who made that comment, but I was you once. Um, that's actually why I my BA is in literature and then my master's is in art history. I flipped because I couldn't figure out how to get them together. I think at the time there weren't as many media studies departments as there are now. Um, and so as I was finishing my master's, they were really beginning to pop up and gaining popularity as a place where you could do these more interdisciplinary studies and think about the nature of media, learn about these kind of metadata alongside people who are maybe studying library sciences and literature and art history and kind of this kind of cross-disciplinary approach that wasn't as available to me at the time. So I, I think those are great programs. Um, but it's, it's definitely a problem that I think is also part of the issue in the pipeline to creating critics who have the background and vocabulary and skills to approach these objects that do come from, as we've already talked about, so many disciplines. Oh, I mean, I'd be interested actually to hear Aaron, Aaron's thoughts on, on the following aspect of this question because of where you sit, Aaron, which is, you know, my sense is that the College Book Art Association does not include, does not have a very large percentage of members who have PhDs, that traditionally uh, book arts have been taught within studio programs. So the master's degree has been the terminal a terminal degree is such a terrible phrase, uh, you know, final degree, it's like, we know all degrees are terminal, but I mean, you know, um, but the, uh, so, you know, I think, um, you know, the question of where this sits within disciplines um, has been a problem for a long time. When I taught at Virginia, where we had rare book school and we had the English department, we had these two polar opposites, right? We had all these people in the English department who read books and never looked at them. We had all these people in rare books who looked at books and never read them. All right, and some someplace in between these two things, right? We needed to forge, um, you know, the space for for the future Megans of this world. But um, I will. Uh, I just want to call attention to the work of someone I think is absolutely superb in, in this regard, and that's Anna Arner. Um, whose work has been, she had a fantastic book on Mallarmé and actually today, this morning, she had sent me an article about a 2020 um, publication on reading the, you know, the book within exhibit contexts where they're really sculptural, installational, and thinking about why these works have such resonance, you know, how the book is a cultural icon or a symbol sort of works. But, you know, she she's, you know, an academic who's engaged with book arts. And, and again, you know, Matt Kirschenbaum and Leah Price and um, my colleague, Danny Snelson. I mean, I think for any kind of PhD work, what you have to do is find somebody at an institution doing the work you want to do. And then you apply to the institution because um, for something, all PhD work is fairly specialized. So, so you do want to identify a mentor in advance of applying to a program. That that would be my advice. I know it's very prosaic, but <laughs> so. But I, but tell me, I mean, Erin, what it, do you see many PhDs within the College Book Art Association, or what, am I correct in my perception? Or what's your thought? Um, yeah, I think you're you're right. Like it's built like it sort of was initially built out of studio programs. Um, and that's that remains, I think, kind of the core of it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we're, we've been making a, an effort to get more librarians and scholars and critics and things um, as members of the organization. Um, so, you know, but I, I think, yeah, there just there hasn't been as many because, again, that's not where it formed. Um, thinking about um, the what you were just saying, Joanna, about um, sort of like the English departments and art departments and things like that. Like my my job at my school, I'm situated in the library and I work across the college. Um, and um, academically, I actually tend to work more with the English department than I do with our art department, which to me is really interesting. They're both wonderful departments filled with wonderful people. Um, but just in terms of like the curriculum, like that's where the interest is. Um, and that also made me think of um, like in terms of thinking about PhD programs, uh, like a, a program, like a literary program that also is maybe like has a strong connection to a studio program, like the University of Utah is one um, where Craig Dworkin is. Um, 
that came to mind, I know um, Anne Royston, um, who wrote a wonderful book about artist books, um, came through that program. And so, um, yeah, so that's that would just be another thing. I'm also come from a studio background, right? So that's where my bias is as well. Um, so um, I tend to think in those terms. Yeah, this is something that I'm actually interested in and in thinking about the disciplinary backgrounds of future critics and of writers of artist book criticism is the fact that out of the four of us, you, I didn't even realize this, Levi, until you said it in the intro, I'm the only one who doesn't make books. I'm not an artist. So this kind of studio MFA artist practitioners as critic is very interesting to me. And I wonder what people's thoughts are on that. Or if I, I saw someone in the chat mentioning at some point in time that everyone who writes about artist books should take a book binding class or some kind of making class. And that's something that's really interesting to me. I've taken printmaking classes, but I've never made a book. So I'm familiar with printing processes, not as familiar with the mechanics of making bindings, though I know a bit about them having studied artist books for many years now. But I'm just interested if you have any thoughts on this as a kind of another institution, the MFA or artist studio practice institution that leads to criticism. I mean, I, I'll, for one thing, just commiserate because I'm actually in the process of applying to art history PhD programs. Um, so I don't know how much advice I would have if, if uh, the person who asked that question doesn't want to email me, I could at least, you know, share how that process has been for me. Um, and, and I will also say that as a moderator for the CBAA blog, two of the um, um, submissions that I've solicited from people here at University of Missouri have been from the English department um, uh, to you know, doctoral students in creative writing that have been really interesting. One focusing more on pedagogy and one like pretty straight um, theory and criticism. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think a lot of what we've talked about within the College Book Art Association um, is looking at like the incentive structure for, you know, even like with peer reviewed publications, which, you know, take a lot of time and it's a lot to ask of somebody both to have reviewers and for the, the person writing it. If you are in an academic, you know, like in an MFA program, you don't get a lot of credit as far as tenure and promotion for all of that work. Um, it's just not really like baked into the structure. Um, you know, so I do, I wonder if in that regard, the, the academic home of, you know, some of the artist books and where the criticism is coming from is maybe to the detriment of criticism. Okay, one other question that I think um, might be particularly relevant um, in the time of COVID-19 is, um, would the reviewers among you consider reviewing a book based on photos slash description and or a video of all the pages. What other ideas do you have for reviewing a very limited object? Um, for me, I, I would not consider that. I actually make it a rule that my reviewers cannot write from a PDF or something like that, they, they have to see the book. If they, for whatever reason, can't get a review copy, I do my best to, to create opportunities for them to see the book in person and just use the PDF as reference. Um, I think based on everything we've talked about today, and I'm sure will continue to come up throughout the conference, the uh, material interaction with the book is really key to what makes it so unique and exciting as an artwork. And if you can't have that, the, the documentation alone isn't gonna do it. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm also trying to problem solve ways to get smaller edition, smaller edition runs of books into the hands of my reviewers. Um, if it's possible to loan a review copy, if it's possible to, it's hard during COVID, but to go visit it in the library or even, you know, um, make a drop it off at someone's home for a short period of time. If you live in the neighborhood, all these ways of trying to share the physical objects, I think is really, really important to, to being able to appropriately review the, the object. Yeah, I totally, totally agree, Megan. You know, I mean, I once wrote a piece called The Calisthenics of Composition that had to do with the physical acts of writing, like what it means to write on a mechanical typewriter, what it means to, you know, hold type in your hands, draw on a stone and so forth. The, these things are so physical. And I would suggest a, a, a pendant piece to that, which is the ergonomics of criticism, which is that, you know, there's a kind of 
physical business of the space from which you read. And as again, you know, the, in, when, um, you know, when you're working with people who are developing a project, the first thing I say to them is you have to print it out. You can't see what a, something is on the screen. You don't know what the scale is. You don't know what the reading distance is. You don't know what any of the sort of like, you know, basic physiological engagement and cognitive engagement with that object is. And we've all been in exhibits where somebody's made a book that's so big, there's no viewing angle from which you can look at it, right? It's like that, so, so that's a statement, what's it about? But it's not about reading, it's not about engaging. Um, but, you know, I would suggest another thing. Um, yeah, I got you in mind, Megan, for this. Um, <laughs> is the Artist Books Roadshow. Okay, so, you know, couldn't we have fun having visiting critics come and work with you to sort of people bring their books and it's like, okay, you know, the critic sees it cold. You, you have to go through as, as we've been doing in the book clinics. And, you know, you, you say, okay, look, this is working here. This is really great. Let's see, you know, you, you, you pull to attention the things that are really engaging and interesting about a work. And every once in a while, you might have to say, well, you might want to rethink, you know, using banana peels as your binding, you know, or whatever. So, you know, um, anyway, so yeah, I think, I think, you know, something like that would be really fun. I love that idea. Yeah. And I would just echo what you said. Something that I, in my own writing about artist books, I'm especially interested in is the relationship of the book and the body. Uh, and you're just not going to get a scale is obviously missing when you're looking at documentation of something, even if you have those videos with the person's hands. I mean, it's just, it's not really the same thing. Um, I will also then say one flip side of this is I do think there's such a thing as a digital native artist book. So for those kinds of projects, um, certainly they can be experienced in a different way. Um, and that's something we, we haven't really talked at all about, but I think that's definitely possible. If, if the form that the book takes is digital, then I'm happy to experience it that way. And I can say for artist book reviews, this was the first pushback and question that I consistently got was people that either you know, worked in very small edition sizes or just didn't, you know, have the, the funds to mail something. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think, and I have to give all the credit to my partner, um, Carly Gomez, who, you know, sort of gave me the solution when I was really troubled by this because it does have like real implications for equity and accessibility. And, you know, she just said, well, why don't you just open like a limited you know, reading period, like one month of the year where, you know, you can, instead of just receiving hard copies and keeping them, you can open it up and have people pitch it to you using photos, videos, et cetera. So I'm not ever going to write the review based on that, but what I will do is take email submissions in whatever form, you know, there's no like strict guidelines, just whatever the artist thinks best presents the work. And then I will tell people like, yes, I'll review that. And then in that case, um, one month out of the year, sort of for the purposes of equity, I pay for that and I pay to have them ship it and ship it back. And then there's sort of partially subsidized ones, which as opposed to like trying to worry so much about that, it's more people have, you know, an, a unique object and they just want it back. Um, in that case, they pay for shipping, but I'll still let them take it back. Um, and, you know, the mechanics of that are really tricky, but I do think it's important to at least have that as an option um, because I do think making sure that everybody who wants access to critical attention for their work can get it. Um, and then I am curious um, to hear Aaron talk about this because I think his work is maybe like the most kind of in between digital and analog and back and forth between. So this idea of like a native digital artist book or even like what you can make of an artist book in a digital space. I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, sure. Uh, bef um... One thing I wanted to mention too about this idea of like uh, like reviewing books and things like that. One thing that I'm really excited about for an upcoming uh, sort of publication imprint that I'm going to be working with a poet named Divya Victor on um, is just building. They're going to be like small editions, thirty books probably, but building in like X amount of copies, two or three from every edition, not for reviews necessarily, but to send to people to teach them. Um, so, um, and I'm sure other artists have done this in the past, but just like say like three copies are like the teaching copies. We 
put this you know really neat packaging system together we send them out they send them back um and the additions just get destroyed through use and we just like they're just part that's like what happens to them and i think that's fine um so I, i'm excited about that uh, for future projects um to kind of get around some of these access things um to your question about the digital native um stuff uh i won't talk about it for a long time but for me right like artist books are text image and time um and so like other things, you know, like a GIF is also can be that, right? Um, a PDF can be that, a website can be that. Um, so many things can be that. Um, and I've been playing around really rudimentary kind of animations and GIFs and stuff and just having a blast, like thinking about um, how all these things uh, work together. So um, I, yeah, it's like a very, you know, um, I'm really interested in also like digital republication, again, which Ugly Duckling Press is really good at. Um, and um, other kinds of things like that, thinking about ways to do that. I love that concise three text image time. I'm going to use that. Yeah, I would add materials, um, and I'll be the I'll be the contrarian and say digital books aren't books, just because somebody's got to say it. Um, and and I believe that they're not, but um, but that's okay. The, oh, can um, I ask you why? Uh, sorry, I know there's other. Can I ask you why you don't think they're books? Well, because to me, a book is is a physical object. I mean, it, re it really is. I think there are features of, you know, development, sequence, unfoldingness, you know, time, space that that occur in a film, and a film is not a book. So that's mm -hmm. all. I think a digital artifact is a digital artifact. It does different kinds of things. So, I mean, again, I'll just be contrarian. But I, but I want to pick up on some of the, a thread that's been going through the questions. It has to do with unique books. Um, and, um, and uh, Molly Schwartzberg, um, my former colleague at Virginia, um, poses this question about how well, the issue of access makes it hard for unique books to get attention. And so, yeah, there's great electronic literature, exactly. Um, and um, so um, I totally agree. Um, but um, so the unique book. So this is again where the Artist Book Roadshow is gonna really make a difference because people can show up with their precious, unique, wonderful, one of a kind, they can bring it in in a baby buggy, you know, and it can be in case, you know, and, and, the, and bring it out and have it discussed and talked about, it would be great. Because again, there are things that need to be made simply as unique objects. And, you know, nobody has a problem, you know, with the idea that there's only one Mona Lisa, right? It's like, it gets plenty of attention. And you know, so, you know, the, the I, I think, you know, it, it is an issue of access and, and Molly's right, it gets very difficult to be able to, uh, and when we did Century of Artists books, it was the one area that was really hard for us because editioned books show up in lots of collections. Unique books, you know, are often really difficult to 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 find, let alone look at. So, again, I think you know, calling attention to them and appreciating them and seeing how they work is great. And um, really, I think you know, at least five minutes of every um, artist book roadshow should be dedicated to a unique book. The comments in the chat here are just so great. All these people having conversations about their unique books and the problems of purchasing them for institutions, of traveling them. It's it's thanks to all the really thoughtful participants here. Yeah, I'm, I also make unique books and like, yeah, it's like a real <laughs> problem. But I love, you know, I love doing them and they like do this other yeah. thing that, um, you know, yeah. printed books can't. And so, yeah. Um, but it's it is a huge problem. But yeah, and again, like the idea of like even like shipping them around, which would be horrible and terrifying, right? But so like so Levi or Megan could review them, you know, like what a <laughs> wonderful opportunity that would be. But also like, yeah, yikes, right? <laughs> this is fantastic. Thank you all so so much. Um, we're about five minutes over, so I'm gonna stop the recording, but I'm gonna leave the room open if people want to continue to chat and um, ask questions. Uh, thank you all so much to the presenters. Thank you all for attending. Um, this was wonderful conversation. I really appreciate you all being here.